Our scripture lesson for today comes from 1 Kings chapter 19. The Lord said to Elijah, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, a wind so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in, a, in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And there he came to hear a voice that said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Please pray with me. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. My claim in this sermon is simple. Silence is a spiritual necessity. Whether you seek it out or fall into it, we need sacred silence for spiritual renewal. The summer before my freshman year of high school, I went on a two-week caving trip that I'll never forget. We went deep into the heart of the earth, into caves all over uh, Tennessee and Georgia. I got sticky mud over every inch of clothing that I brought with me. And donning headlamps, we saw bats and made it through underground passages that I could barely fit through and went into underground caverns the size of football stadiums. It was certainly a strange trip. One night we slept in a cow field because it was cave adjacent, and one night we literally slept in a cave itself. And once we paddled into the cave in a canoe. It was truly the only way in. The mouth of the river came out from the earth. And so once we had paddled inside the cave, there was the sound of water and the echo of the earth's walls that sent shivers down your spine. We'd been traveling for days together, and so even though we were a team of teenagers, we had already moved past that awkward silence part of team bonding, despite not knowing each other when the trip began. We could be quiet without awkwardness. One of our guides had a beautiful voice, and she started singing Simon and Garfunkel's The Sound of Silence. Her voice filled the cavern, making it feel warm and welcoming, despite the fact that you, didn't, you weren't able to see into all the nooks and crannies of that dark space. All there was was silence after she sang. When the song was over, everyone was quiet. In fact, we turned off our headlamps and just listened. We sat there in the darkness, and the silence was a gift to us. The sound of the water barely noticeable, just our breath and the smell of the earthy mud. I hope you've had an experience like this, a moment of sound punctuated by silence. Sometimes the symphony can usher in silence like that, or a rock concert. French Impressionist composer Claude Debussy says that music is not the notes. Music is not the notes, but the spaces between them. And Miles Davis says the same. It's not the notes you play, he says. It's the notes you don't play. Silence is a sacred necessity. And then there's American experimental composer John Cage, who famously wrote a seemingly absurdist piece called 433, a song of complete silence. 
in which the performer, quote unquote performer, sits down at the piano, opens the sheet music, counts out four minutes and 33 seconds of rest, and then stands up from the piano and exits the stage. John Cage wrote this piece because he wrestled with the idea that sound and silence have so much to do with each other. He visited an anechoic chamber, a soundproof, reverberation-free room underground, intentionally a quiet space, seeking out the experience of absolute silence, only to be disappointed by two loud sounds that he just couldn't shake. He was in the deep, dark, uh, underground room that had been created specifically for silence, and yet there were two sounds that carried with him. And afterwards, he asked the sound engineer what was going on, and he was told that those two sounds were, in fact, his own body. The higher tone was the ringing of his nervous system, and the lower noise was his blood circulation. At which point, Cage realized that he had always assumed silence existed somewhere, pure silence. But even his own body carried sound within it. And so he decided, no silence exists that is not pregnant with sound. No silence exists that is not pregnant with sound. And so for me, it might be more important to put it this way. No silence exists that is not pregnant with sacred sound. And I think you might agree with me. For example, if I were to pick two hymns for Kenilworth Union Church that are universally at Kenilworth Union Church's top ten I would have to include Silent Night and Amazing Grace. They are both inescapable classics, ubiquitous, quintessential, time-honored, and approachable hymns. Even the least church-going among us would know the first verse of both of those hymns and would definitely be able to hum the tune. Humming the tune of Silent Night, in fact, on Christmas Eve in our sanctuary is the thing that I think of most. When it comes to Silent Night, we are a bit like Miles Davis. It's not the notes you play, it's the notes you don't play. Or in other words, it's not the words you sing, but the melody that you hum. Humming the tune of Silent Night on Christmas Eve pushes us to a wordless attentiveness to the divine that allows us to welcome silence, even and especially in the bustle of Christmas. And Amazing Grace, another hummable melody, says that grace is a sweet sound, a sweet sound that is likely impossible to hear, something we've literally never heard, and yet a sound to me that must in some way leave room for sacred silence. Amazing grace, how sweet a sound. Does silence matter? I think it does. We need quiet places where we can disrupt the, the general experience of noise. Music is not the notes but the spaces between them. Music is not the notes you play, but the notes you don't. Silence is that entryway into the divine. And our scripture passage today says something similar. The main character, Elijah, is a biblical character of myth and legend. He's larger than life and walks in the legacy of Moses. Elijah has remarkable powers to enact miracles, and he is charged with religious and political command at a time when the urgent conflict between Yahweh and Baal is tense and heightened. Yahweh, of course, the God of Scripture, our God, and Baal, the quote-unquote enemy God. And Elijah 
He's also tangled up in political intrigue. He warns the king and queen, Ahab and Jezebel, that a famine is coming, but Ahab and Jezebel are notoriously wicked rulers with a marked regard, disregard for God's word, and so they make no preparations that the, for the famine that is coming. And so Elijah and all of the people suffer hunger. Elijah barely survives and is taken in by a widow and the widow's son, who ultimately save him, making bread with a miraculously small portion of flour. And as if that wasn't enough, Queen Jezebel threatens to kill Elijah. And feeling the emotional whiplash and physical exhaustion of starvation and political peril, Elijah goes off to the wilderness alone. He's on the run, isolated and afraid. Elijah is stressed and physically depleted and without resources. And he holds up in a cave for a while. Elijah is about to give up, and in fact, at one point, he even prays for death. He feels abandoned, without a way forward. And like us, Elijah turns to silence. Because that's what we do, isn't it? Whether it's not knowing what to say in response to another season of forest fires, or not knowing what to say in another hurricane season with Houston on the map again, or not knowing what to say in the midst of politics of injustice that are just too much. Sometimes silence and settling down and being quiet is just how we endure tragedy. We need that time alone. We need that time away. We need to escape to the wilderness. One researcher in silence talked to a room full of teenagers about what silence means to them and was surprised when they talked about tragedy more than the physicality of silence itself. One teenager said that they refused to speak for months after their mom died. Another teenager said that he stopped talking at the age of six after watching his stepdad hit his mom. He didn't have words to talk about what he had experienced there, and so he didn't use words to say anything for many months. And one teenager said that she was bathed in, in silence. All sound seemed to stop when she walked out the church after her grandmother's funeral. Silence pervaded her experience of grief. And so we need silence. Silence is a spiritual necessity, a way for us to retreat into healing and into a new way. And that's what happened for Elijah, too. That is when God drew near to him in a new way. For Elijah's whole life, God showed up in dramatic ways, in fire and earthquake and loud theophanies. But this time, God is not in the powerful wind, the exaggerated theatrics of earthquakes and fires. But instead, God shows up for Elijah out in the wilderness as an ancient, gentle whisper, as a still, small voice, as a soft whisper or a low murmur, as the sound of a gentle breeze, as close to divine silence as we can muster. The word of God comes to Elijah up there in the wilderness as an ordinary whisper, enlivening the prophet who is drenched in sorrow. Sometimes the world puts undue, unimaginable pressures on us as individuals, as a society. And sometimes we put even more pressure on ourselves. And I expect that 
given the reality of the pressure you've been under these days, given the significance of the experiences you've had these last weeks and months, given the amplification of isolation for some, if not all, and given the undue sorrow and unexpressed grief that each of us carry in our own ways, you too, like Elijah, have spent time in a wilderness-like state, wondering what the way out will look like. And that means that you, too, have the capacity to listen in silence. For God in the low whisper, God in the gentle silence, God in that still, small voice. You, too, will see God unveiled after the storm, after the fire, after the earth shattering. These are hard days. And in the silence, in the holy spaces between the cacophony and the wild noisy din, there is a divine song being sung, if we just walk out from where we've been sheltering to hear it. Amen.